In Climate Watch, tomorrow is World Oceans Day. It's a day where action groups remind the public of the importance of oceans, while also shedding light on the damage humans are doing to one of Earth's most beautiful life sources. Now, some of the major issues facing our oceans include a widespread problem of plastic pollution as well as the growing effects of climate change. Joining us now on set is Galen Rosenwack. She's a marine scientist and explorer of the oceans. She founded Global Ocean Exploration to help drive awareness and find solutions to the challenges facing the seas. So we've been talking about the fact that it's World Ocean Day. First of all, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. it's so great to have you. Um, you we just sort of said the damage that humans do to one of the world's most precious resources and the growing effect of climate change. What is that effect of climate change on the oceans? Well, the effect of climate change is widespread. I think that every single thing in the ocean from, you know, ocean temperature to the smallest animals in the ocean to the largest are affected by climate change. Um, and so I think when we talk about climate change as a whole, it's affecting every little particle of the ocean, right? Because increasing temperature changes the density of the water. So that's something that's inhibiting movement of animals and then also different warmer water, you get more plank phytoplankton blooms and then it really affects the ecosystem from top down and bottom up. Right. So scientists estimate 5 million to 13 million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean every year. Right. I don't think most of us who go swimming at the beach see that. Right. right. We hear this statistic. You go, oh, that sounds like a lot. But right. we don't see it. Right. We don't see it. What is that doing? Well, it's again, it has many widespread effects. And unfortunately, I think more and more when you go to the beach, you are actually seeing it. Because if you look on the sand, you're going to find, you know, everything from cigarette lighters to cigarette butts to bottles to small pieces of plastic, plastic bags sort of blowing around. But what's it doing? Well, Animals are eating the plastic, they're ingesting the plastic, and then that's mm. filling up their stomachs, which is then in turn, you know, poisoning them essentially. So you see the whales that are right. washing up on the beach filled with plastic. So you right. see turtles or albatross in Midway Island and they can't survive because they, they see this micro, this small plastic and they think it's food. Then they feed mm. it to their chicks and then they can't survive. So unfortunately it's leading to widespread death of our marine creatures. And it's everything from tiny micro particles up through the bigger things, you know, like big tubs from fishing boats or fishing nets and, and things like that. What's our responsibility? Just recycle? I mean, is it that simple? No, unfortunately, recycling isn't going to fix the problem because most of what we actually recycle is, you know, not all ending up at a recycling plant, right. not turning into something that we can reuse. I think it's really about reducing how much plastic we use, especially single use plastic. So okay. if you go to get a coffee at Starbucks, don't take a lid things like that, don't use a straw, mm. paper straws. And there's little things that we can do every day. And then if we start small, also single use grocery bags. So bring your own grocery bag to the right. store. Right, right. And so if we do little things like that, it'll be cumulative. And then that will become part of your every day. Um, my mother always uses the example where, you know, when she was a kid, people would just throw their litter out the window of the car. Right. Oh, but sure. now nobody does that. And it's something that we would all think that's crazy, no matter who you see do it. So it's the same thing. It just has to become something, and then from there it builds. So yeah. we start easy, and then but everything But, you know, easier. it's interesting. There's a couple of things. One is I, I asked our producers to find this picture of this bird that was wearing a plastic bag. I don't know if they were able to locate that. It sort of went viral this week. Look, look Take a look at this. This is, this is just a bird, and wow. it's covered in this plastic and wow. one wonders how it will even survive um, and it's just mind-boggling and that's one image where people see oh there's a real problem here but the the reality is that even when we make a conscious effort for example as you say to not use plastic lids for coffees I recently found out that this is gonna sound <laughs> so you know if you use a scrub like facial scrub yeah. um, the, 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 the little beads the little the beads, little beads in, yeah. those, in those facial yeah. scrubs are plastic totally. I didn't know that I totally. thought that they were I don't know what I thought they were yeah. and then a scientist told me well no when you use that you wash your face it goes into the drain yep. and out into the ocean and it's tiny and microscopic but not to a fish and a right. fish will ingest that and it leads to a whole host of issues exactly yeah so what do you do about things like microbeads right well we unfortunately many um, states have banned microbeads and so I think that it needs to happen on a much larger scale so that we don't even have to think about it when we go by the the products so right. that they're just not there. They're also in a lot of toothpaste. But that's so that's so. the that was the second point I wanted to make, um, which is you say that it's important for us as individuals to take action, but I always feel like that there are larger forces pushing up against 
individuals. In other words, the companies that manufacture these things. Sure. I mean, if they just stopped making them and they started mm -hmm. making, you know, biodegradable products and, you know, um, instead of using plastic storage for your coffee, you got wooden ones or whatever, then most people would become used to the idea. But it always feels as if, and I don't mean scientists, but I feel like the government and other forces say, you know, you should take personal responsibility, David. We're not looking at companies who actually are polluting the environment at a greater scale than any one individual or even collectively. Could. Right. And I think that there's there's two ways of looking at it. One, it's sort of a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach. So individually, we need to demand that the changes happen. But from the top down, certainly passing laws and policies to eliminate these things, you know, are definitely equally, if not more important. Mm. So that we don't, again, as a consumer, we really care. And it's important for our government to know that we care. So to vote on those issues, to make it clear, to lobby, to write letters to, you know, your congressmen and senators and I things was, like that. I was at a restaurant in Puerto Rico recently and I wanted a straw and she said, oh, we just stopped serving them. Wow. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And, and some restaurants are now doing the paper straws. Yeah. You know, um, you, you did an expedition recently to Palau. Yes. You studied coral reefs. What was sort of the headline for you coming away for that? Well, so I was really fortunate. I'm working with a team of scientists from three different universities on this initiative. Um, and I'm making a film about the project that they're doing, which is more of a hopeful story about climate change. Because yeah. in Palau, the corals are healthy and vibrant. And there's inshore reefs that are very warm and acidic, which are sort of projecting the temperatures that we're going to see in our global oceans in the future. Then there's the offshore reefs that are also very healthy, um, where there's cooler water. They'll be more affected by an increase in temperature and acidity that we're going to see. because are more like today normal conditions that we see today. So the exciting thing about this work is that these we know that we think that these corals will survive into the future and in these different conditions. So it's about learning about the mechanisms between um, between the symbiotic algae and the animal, the coral animal, because a lot of people don't realize that corals are animals. Right. And so to keep so we know that maybe the Coral reefs will change in the future, how they look, but we do know that corals have been around for a very long time, so probably will just change how a coral reef ecosystem looks. Let me ask you this final question um, about, you were talking about coral reefs. Uh, I've been a couple of times to the Maldives where I've gone diving, and a couple of years ago there was some concern. Rising uh, ocean temperatures had killed off a lot of the uh, very beautiful uh, coral that they have there, and it was bleaching, it was turning white. And then, Somehow or another, Mother Earth sort of was able to fend off whatever it was that was happening in the ecosystem, and the coral came back more beautiful than ever. And I guess the question I have is, despite the, the virus that is sometimes humanity on the planet, the planet is actually more resilient and stronger than we possibly could think, and some of these reefs are able to come back, and that does give us some hope for the future. Absolutely. I think that you put it back, you just said, you kind of like hit the nail on the head saying that nature is resilient. Nature has, you know, adapted to changes throughout its hit. Like the globe has been in warming cycles and cooling cycles throughout time. Corals have persisted. So hopefully, you know, in those situations, the pro it wasn't a prolonged exposure to the very warm temperatures so that they were able to bounce back. And I think that it's really about having a healthy ecosystem to start out with. So what we need to do is really work hard to keep our systems as healthy as they can be so that if we throw off the ecosystem, they won't be as resilient. Mm -hmm. Nature is fragile, but it's also very robust. Am I crazy to think this nature is kind of like our immune system? It's constantly saving us and making us better, but at some point cancers develop when we keep beating up the immune system right. and abusing it. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's about staying as healthy as you can right. to be able to fight it when it comes. Right. It's sort of a ripple effect, though, because even though even if something is able, in the case of coral, for example, able to regenerate itself, in the wake of some of those warmer temperatures, for example, in the Antarctic, polar bears may die, orcas may not find uh, the proper, you know, temperatures that they need to, um, to, to, to survive themselves, and then it has a cascading effect. So from the apex uh, creatures to, and where the top sure, of the food chain, down. and it rolls yeah, down to yeah. everything else, yeah. right? Absolutely. I think one thing to understand about nature as a whole, or maybe our, just our planet as a whole, is everything is linked. So if you take out one small thing, it's going to have a ripple effect. So we need to try to keep everything as in balance as possible. It's so, you can tell we're clearly into this subject. I was about to say, thank you yeah. for making yeah. us care. Yeah, well, it's a I great mean, story. I, you know, um, my beloved Louisiana coastline is slowly disappearing yeah. because of what you're talking about, changes, man-made and 
climate oriented. So, Absolutely. Anyway, thanks. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Galen Rosenwax, we appreciate it. Thank you.